Welcome to Epicenter. This is episode 473. This is the show that talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Sebastian Quijillo, and I'm here with my co-host, Brian Crane and Felix Lush. How's it going, guy? Very good. Pretty good. A little tired, but looking forward to this. I think we're all a little bit tired. Um, <laughs> we all have little eyes, I can see. Um, it is early, though. But uh, we are today going to discuss, um, you know, this is kind of our year-end wrap-up episode. It's coming towards the end of the year. And, well, I guess it's safe to say lots has happened this year. And uh, we're going to go over all of that and hopefully make some sense of it. And hopefully make some sense of what's coming in the future. Um, that is, if there is a future uh, to be had. But before we do that, I'd like to first talk about our sponsor this week, Tally Ho. Tally Ho is an open source wallet redefining the wallet as a public good. With Tally Ho, you can safely connect to DeFi and Web3, plus a lot more. You can view your NFTs in their wallet across Ethereum, Polygon, Optimism, and Arbitrum, and they have really great ledger support. Uh, you can also swap between assets and view all of your account balances across their portfolio tab. Currently, they're running a layer two adventure. That rewards users for exploring Arbitrum, the Arbitrum ecosystem with Tally Ho. You can get a Space Dog NFT when you participate, and you'll be entered to into a giveaway uh, for another NFT. So head over to their website, tally.cash, to check it out. I think Federica told me that Tally is a type of dog that hunts foxes, um, which is kind of clever branding when you think about it. Um, yeah, head over to tally.cash to check it out. So guys, uh, there's another really great product that you know, I've been using over the last couple of weeks, and it's like this really great resume builder. And it's going to come in handy when we're all looking for new jobs in January. Um, I wonder if you are also like, you know, sprucing up your resume uh, for, uh, you know, for when, when you're out of work in a couple of months. Well, actually, I've been trying to open a bank account, and then they were like, be quiet a uh, resume so i actually did <laughs> really <my> resume. <laughs> yes <laughs> what kind of kyc is going on these days i know, Seriously, I you had know. To... oh my god oh uh, that's <laughs> that's that's pretty good that's pretty good wow um well so you know we we uh we came here to talk about uh like you know kind of look back on the last year and um you make some sense of what's going on now and what the sentiment is and how that might affect uh, the future uh, for the industry. And so, yeah, I think I, I, I'm not really sure where to start. I mean, like lots of great things happened this year. Um, you know, like the merge happened, which, which was huge. I, I feel like it was eclipsed by a whole bunch of other stuff, but uh, at least in, in like the ecosystem that I, that I roll in. Um, but then of course there was like the Luna collapse uh, which was a huge blow to the ecosystem and like I think just like general confidence in the space um, affected lots of teams uh, also like tangibly. And then, you know, we thought we were kind of out of the woods and then, well, this happens like the FTX um, fraud uh, debacle, whatever you want to call it. And now like Luna just, you know, pales in comparison. I feel like, I feel like uh, Luna was like, a minor events compared to uh, what what this will um, what this will provoke in, in terms of you know, potential like backlash on the ecosystem and just like regulation and just o overall trust being degraded um, in the in the technology and also just like the space generally. Do you guys uh, yeah. do you guys uh, sort of agree with uh, with that thesis? <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I I'm not sure. Right. Like one, one of the things that's like, so I, I've had a financial times subscription for the last maybe three years or something. I don't know. And I, uh, I, I tend to sort of check out the crypto articles a little bit in there and especially the comment section. And it was always pretty skeptical. I would say there was a time maybe last year where there was a little bit more balance. You know, there was like some people who were like, yeah, no, it's actually some interesting stuff happening. And, there was a little bit of that, but then I feel like this year, you know, earlier this year, it just changed to, I mean, one is the articles are mostly negative, but the comment section is basically just, this is a complete scam. Like this is all a gigantic scam. It has to like die. 
there was an interesting article I read like some months ago where, I mean, maybe like a month ago or something like that. But it was basically like, hey, we really should stop trying to regulate this crypto thing because this crypto thing is just a scam. And by like regulating it, you're giving it some sort of legitimacy that it doesn't deserve. But as we've seen now with FTX collapse and stuff like that, it's kind of isolated. It doesn't sort of affect, you know, the real economy and the, the, the real banks. So like, let's just, you know, segregate it, say that like none of the financial institutions are allowed to touch this sort of dumpster fire and then it will just sort of die its own death there. And, and that's sort of the, the way to go. And, you know, all of the comments were like, that makes so much sense. Finally, someone is saying, <laughs> finally, someone is like saying it out loud. And like, <laughs> so, and I saw this thread from Zuzu, which is another bizarre thing, you know, because the guy is basically also uh, seems like a bit of a scammer, you no, know, with his three arrows capital where they were, you know, trying to borrow money, like when they were already insolvent. And like, I guess it looks like lying about their assets by making stuff up. And so it was interesting, you know, how <laughs> how they're like, briefly disappeared and then, you know, come back like a month later, two months later, like giving, sharing wisdom about the other scammers and stuff like that. But uh, I, I think I, I think I read somewhere he's trying to raise another fund. I heard that, I read that somewhere too, yeah, I don't know if that's true. But one of the things he did say that I actually felt was quite accurate, which was basically that, and then I feel it's very much reflected in this kind of financial times, you know, type commentary, that I think for a lot of people like outside of crypto, and you know, let's say in the traditional financial system, or it, it this crypto thing is just like one huge scam, right? Like it's all, and so then F S FTX and like S, you know, Sam Bankman Fried and stuff doesn't look any worse than any of the rest, right? And if anything, maybe slightly better because he was at least like giving some money away to, even if it wasn't his money, to some kind of causes. So I feel like it also explains a little bit maybe that, you know, to people in the crypto thing, there's like big difference, right? There's like a lot of great things. And then there are like someone like SPF who's like complete fraud and we're all like find it bizarre that they sort of, that he doesn't get treated like this complete fraud in the mainstream media. But I think if you look at it kind of through that lens, it's, it's kind of makes sense. Um, yeah, I don't know what that all means. But I, I definitely, read somewhere, I would say, I, yeah, I, I mean, I would definitely say just maybe just the, the kind of yeah. uh, final comment here. Yeah, I, I would say in the times, you know, that I've been in crypto, which is now, I guess, nine and a half years or something like that, this is the most negative uh i think that the opinions that i feel like you see about crypto uh in in the wider media and world i feel are the most negative that they've ever been um yeah i, I was just gonna say i i i uh i was reading a tweet this morning yeah because there, there there was this i think this um this confusion or or people people were were somewhat surprised that the people in the audience went so S, uh, SBF did this interview with at this New York Times event and you know people were applauding him and but what uh what this what this tweet was was like a screenshot of 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 some article but were basically that was claiming that the people were applauding him for for essentially like having destroyed crypto it was you know they weren't applauding him to to congratulate him or to, you know to to like uphold him as like some some sort of uh you know good person but it was in fact uh be because uh you know because like he was he was in fact like sort of destroying this this dumpster fire like finally destroying this dumpster fire and and i was like oh okay yeah that, like, like that kind of makes sense i wish i could find the tweet but i can't find it anymore anyway but yeah i mean yeah felix what do you think yeah, I, I guess I actually like 
related to the Financial Times thing, I've followed a little bit the Reddit communities over time and they've also been switching a lot into more, yeah, this all a scam, you know, like it's pretty negative sentiment for sure. I think overall though, I guess, you know, the killer use case for crypto is finance or DeFi. And I think that propped up a lot of the market, it created a lot of leverage, right? And then these these people like, like actually Luna is, is full of leverage, right? SBF is full of leverage, uh, Zuzu, every one of those and they're they're like the loud voices i guess and obviously when the market as a whole changes bear market comes they get washed out which should actually be a good thing but in this case i guess it takes with it a bunch of like, innocent people but um i i guess that's that's kind of what happened and, and it's not super surprising if you look at it in in hindsight because i guess svf it was actually his first um b cycle basically he came in in 2019 it was a bear market and i think he said somewhere in an interview the maximum he expected was a 30 percent drawdown or something which is uh, obviously not what happened he should, have, he should have looked at the crypto charts you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah so so but yeah i guess you know then these are the things that people see right the, the big highs the big lows but i guess in parallel we have all these technology being built, but that's not really being talked about in the mainstream media or because I guess the use cases are just also very limited to the finance thing. And so I'm not super surprised that this is, is the sentiment in the wider sense, but I guess, yeah, to me, still nothing much has changed about the fundamentals. Um, I think uh, I think we all underestimate the amount of understanding that people outside our bubble have about this stuff. And uh, like even, even people who are kind of informed about finance. So I'll give you an example. I was in Dubai last week and we were at this uh, alternative, alternative investment manager summit. And, you know, like a lot of the folks here are obviously, um, like smart and like educated about finance and about markets and about yeah like the whole space of finance uh like tri-fi but also fintech and overwhelmingly the people i spoke with had like no notion or like very fuzzy notions about the distinction between you know cfi F ftx type platforms like binance etc binance was a sponsor there also by the way um and like DeFi, you know, I've, I've, I had to have several conversations where, you know, really coming back to first principles and like explaining what the difference is between like a decentralized finance platform and, and, and like an FTX type platform. And um, it was kind of surprising, you know, um, you know, I would talk to people and like start I, and I, I felt I was kind of losing them. It's like, OK, no, wait, like I need to come back and kind of explain things from the, from first principles and. Um, and so it, it, it's, it's kind of like not surprising that like the media, I mean, like the media is even less informed. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, like I think that's one of the biggest challenges here is the it's like crafting narratives that that are accurate, that make sense and um, that uh, that differentiate between like what what FTX is and what DeFi is. Yeah, I mean, the maybe a little bit to i guess what felix and what you said now um the the was the interesting thing is that in DeFi there's basically like no leverage if anything i think luna was like a one system where you could say there was a kind of like leverage mechanism or you had this kind of feedback mechanism that kind of was like leverage like and um and I guess what we did see is that well, Luna grew so much because of that, right? It it because it just allows a kind of explosive growth that is really hard if, if, when you don't have that. And then, but in DeFi, you basically almost don't have that at this point. Maybe it's going to come. Probably it's going to come at least increasingly so. But then you've had people build these uh, systems on top which were all centralized and off-chain. And then they were basically, you know, running kind of 
highly leveraged fractional reserve system, all like lending money to each other and using it as collateral to lend more money and buy more. And, and then in the end, right, for the most part, this was really like a big deleveraging. Uh, now, big deleveraging with also a big amount of fraud mi mixed in there, right? Because I think there was a lot of lying about, uh, oh, we're not leveraged uh, when they were or, or lying about how much leverage there was. <laughs> and then I mean but yeah I think in the long run of course there is a healthy aspect to it I think BlockFi was especially uh, a good example of that right where when they put out these financial results of BlockFi at some point they were like published and they lost like I think it was like 200 million in you know 2020 2021 like the two years or something like that and they had like a thousand people uh, in this company all doing this interest account. So you, it's just like, and, and even in the bull market, right? They lost so much money. And, you know, you can also see that's just like a really bad business, right? That uh, was, you know, I don't think there was like fraud there as, as much as a crappy business that then relied on like, you know, lots of venture funding, lots of risk, but kind of being in denial about the risks they were actually having and then, you know, bear market and it gets wiped out. And of course, that's a good thing in, in, in some level too, right? Because it, um, I think what, what remains is, is going to be much healthier, but pretty painful in the process. Yeah, I mean... But BlockFi was like this, you know, respected company, you know, I mean, like to some extent FTX as well, but I think even more, so, I mean, from my, my perspective, like even more so BlockFi uh, in terms of its I don't know. reputation no, I, I, and like, you know, it's been in this space for a long time. I mean, like at some point, even we were like, hey, BlockFi would be a good sponsor for Epicenter, you know? Um, I mean, I was a user of BlockFi and I did recommend it sometimes. I mean, I felt like when Celsius went down, it was like kind of very clear of like, yeah, no, you don't want to be in this thing. And so, uh, you know, I guess I didn't end up, uh, you know, managed to get out. And uh, I think also tweeted at some point, like, hey, if you're in one of these centralized lending things, like get out. Uh, if anyone still is, right? I think this what's on still standing. Highly, highly recommend taking money out of that. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, like, again, I think it comes down to a lot of, like, understanding of what these things are and education. And, like, I I'll give you an example. Like, uh, like Zengo, for instance, is a wallet that I recommend to a lot of people and that I use, you know, on my phone and stuff. Like, great you know, MPC wallet. But then in Zengo, it's like, hey, earn interest on your crypto. And then you just like move your crypto over to this line. But like people, I think like most people don't know where they're putting their money. They just have like some application they've downloaded. They've bought some crypto. Um, someone told them about it. And then they end up uh, using some service that uh, like is centralized, uh, maybe doing leveraging, um isn't regulated i mean i i think the the really the issue here it, it comes down to like we, we need to regulate like we need to regulate centralized crypto actors in the same way that we regulate financial institutions like that, that, that it seems like the only solution um that will that makes sense like yeah uh, a, i think a, it's a crypto it, lending platform or a crypto exchange is just a traditional finance business running on like a new asset class Right. Yeah, I think it's ironic that like SBF was trying to get the DeFi front ends regulated, but actually the centralized actors are the ones that need the regulation and the DeFi system kind of works the way it is and doesn't need separate regulation in, in my opinion too, because obviously everything is transparent and you can check how these the systems work, how solvent they are, and there cannot be any extra liabilities off chain for a uh, for a DeFi system. So I think, um, yeah, definitely agree to that. 
what what what's your sense that because my my biggest fear here and and i think we'll certainly see some of that is um this this lack of separation in the narrative right uh, between c5 platforms and DeFi platforms will end up uh hurting DeFi because it will also get regulated or um it will like regulations will apply to it that don't make sense for it um, I haven't kept up on Mika so much in the last like six months. I probably should, but um, you know, from like some conversations I've had with people uh, who are close to that issue, you know, there there's a desire to accelerate passing of Mika. Uh, probably apply pretty strict regulation to stable coins, and and um, and I, I think probably like DeFi, some some parts of DeFi will end up having uh, some of the same constraints as CFI, even though it doesn't make sense for them from a, like a practical or operational perspective. Yeah, I mean, I, of course, there's also the big question of like, why, you know, why do they regulate in the first place, right? Is it to actually, you know, reduce risk for people? Eh, maybe a little bit, but, you know, I think mostly it's because uh they are regulators governments central banks are just worried about losing control and the DeFi thing is more threatening yeah. than uh you know some centralized platform that you can more regulate so i think if they can like try to crack down on that then uh you know they're they're They'll try now maybe one thing where i'm i have sort of like a question mark of I'm not sure about which way it's going to go or like the events of this year, like what do they make more likely? Because I think on, on one level, it's also ties into my earlier point, right? I I think for many people, Bitcoin crypto looks a lot less threatening now, you know, because that the asset size is like much smaller you know, a bunch of people lost money, but it's, you know, it's these crypto people anyway, right? And if you don't like crypto and a bunch of crypto people lose money and like, well, you know, bad, bad luck, who do I care? And it didn't really affect the normal financial system, right? It didn't, there was no kind of contagion. So then it's like, okay, are you really going to spend all of this time diving into this complex thing to try to regulate it? Or are you just going to like be yeah, whatever? Uh, now, of course, if there's like, I, I guess it's not going to be like one or the other, but I, I do think the kind of market contraction bear market is is on balance going to make regulation like less likely. Uh, but yeah, if, if of course, let's say Mika, things that are in work over years, it's not like they're going to stop that. And it's not like more regulation isn't still coming. But the thing that was also, I feel, which is... Um, it, it, something that I did not expect and that was interesting this year. I, I would say most people in crypto that I spoken to in the last years, they were more of the opinion that, you know, we had these early crypto adopters and they're more technically savvy and they're more interested in the technology and, 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 uh, and they would be more likely to use, you know, a hardware wallet or like self custodial wallets. And then, you know, you're going to have all these new people coming in and they're much more going to be on, you know, Coinbase or Binance and they use some centralized product. But of course, this year we've seen, uh, we have seen the risk of that and the pains of that, right? And you know, we see more people, I think, moving towards uh, custodial uh, or, you know, where, where people do self-custody. And then I think when you think of the regulation, that's also something where it's pro probably going to be way easier if you do self-custody, you can have more control and, and maybe you could use stuff that you wouldn't be able to use otherwise. So I do feel hopeful that uh, that, that sort of trend is there where actually a lot more crypto is it goes back to like why was this in the first place where you know, people actually control their own assets they control their own private keys they you know initiate their own transactions 
Um, and that, that's, of course, really good. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, I, I follow Oriel. I mean, again, uh, so talking about Zengo here. They're not a sponsor, but I just, I just do love that wallet. Uh, in 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 the days after FTX, like their their installs just like went up like crazy. I think also Ledger um, probably uh, had a lot of uh, you know orders right after after the FTX thing. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, right, let's, let's talk so. about right. other stuff. Sure, what, stuff. What else? Yeah, let's talk about what, what else did you guys think was most important this year? Or like, what did you feel is when we look back in the future on 2022, what will people kind of think, oh, that, that, that happened and that, that ended up having a big impact or was the beginning of something significant? Yeah, I guess the obvious one that we kind of already mentioned is probably the Ethereum merge. So I guess it's like the huge event of like kind of finally moving to proof of stake for Ethereum. Um, and it also like going that smoothly that it kind of didn't make the news. I guess that's also the, the, new, the new thing that the news cycle, you need like something to go wrong, to, to be on people's minds. And, uh, but overall, right. It's, it's impressive how that went down and now how it's all working because it's, it, I guess the first, we weren't really sure, right. Proof of stake was running the, the PKJ was running quite a while, almost two years now with, without any like actual transactions. And, and it wasn't really clear how it would look if this entire DeFi ecosystem of like billions of dollars would move across. And just seeing that that worked and that such a big uh, transition can work in a distributed system, I think is, is something that uh, is very impressive and probably, I don't know if something like this will happen again in the future, or, or maybe it also proves that like we can do these kind of decentralized upgrades uh, to, to our systems at, at such a big scale. So I think that's kind of my main one. I'm not sure if you guys, yeah, probably hopefully agree, <laughs> but yeah definitely i think that was a huge uh huge huge event and uh yeah congratulations to everyone involved i guess that's like an endless amount of organization and people involved mm. i guess you know we of course one were also working on that and like i mean we, we of course uh, this was already right, in the Ethereum white paper at the end of 2013. It's like, oh, it's going to move to proof of stake. And I remember, I think we did like podcasts with Vitalik in, I think maybe 2015 or something. He's like, oh, it's like six months or something or five months. Yeah, episode 58, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, maybe it was 2015. Did he say six know. months back then? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, but we also did like, oh, I remember also we did like lightning episodes in like 2015 and they were like, yeah, three months, lightning is alive. And it'll take more like six years or whatever, five years. Uh, but yeah, no, they, they had this. But in the end, uh, it succeeded. Uh, I mean, it was very successful in... Um, in many aspects, I guess there is a sort of lingering question, probably mostly around, you know, this flashbots, MEV censorship, you know, like, obviously, it's way better in terms of, you know, it's the economics of Ethereum have improved, right? So it's good for Ether holders, you know, because there's less dilution and that's a great thing. And the energy impact has gone down like dramatically and, and sort of game theoretically, the security has gone up. I think it's going to be very positive for Ethereum when, when more, when more kind of institutional interest comes back because the whole of like energy efficiency, green blockchain is going to be huge, right? I think that would be a massive, massive advantage that Ethereum is going to have over Bitcoin. And, but at the same time, right, this whole, yeah, also the separation of proposals, builders, and, you know, now we have that, I think a huge percentage, right, of Ethereum validators are um, following this OFAC sanctions list. I guess that's another thing we didn't add it to the topics, but I think the tornado cash thing is actually a significant event 
of this year as well. Yeah. But so that that does raise the question of, yeah, like the censorship resistance is, I think, a big, big uh, question and challenge for Ethereum that that is ahead. What's the uh, yeah? What's what? How's the community trying? To, I mean, are, is the Ethereum community trying to remedy this? Yeah, I think they do have now as a sort of on the Ethereum roadmap, like censorship resistance. So I think it's it's very, at least there is, a, I think, consensus that this is something that's necessary and that, you know, they're going to work towards and it's an explicit goal. So that like something like, okay, uh, you know, the tornado cash smart contract uh, transactions are being censored to that or something like that, that that's not possible. So I think at least as a, as a goal, I think there's consensus on that and there's like research towards that. I'm not sure. I think there are like ideas for how to address it. I'm not super up to date with like what the ideas are and how long it's going to take and how well they're going to work and what are the other side effects of those ideas. Yeah. yeah. I, I think at a at a high level, right? It, I guess you know this MEV topic came up pretty late, right? Basically, DeFi summer twenty twenty one, maybe even or twenty twenty, and then Flashbots already building this tool to democratize it, and then as a side effect, because they are building this tool and running it themselves, they get a lot of traction with it, and kind of centralize this RPC layer to some degree that, that everyone is using MEV boost. And then, yeah, this tornado cache thing happens in parallel, which probably also no one really saw coming like this. And it somehow ended up with them obviously having to make the choice that they will include the sanctions because they're a US company. And I, I guess it, it's just kind of a matter of time, though, because the goals, like like you said, Brian, they, they are there and, and many people are working towards it. I think even the Flashbot team themselves, right, allow others to run uh, relayers. It's just that their relayer has been dominating based mm -hmm. on kind of the traction it already had with, with searchers and, and validators beforehand. So it's just generating more um, income. So, But but I you can already see it going down a little bit with like other relayers coming in and some of them not um, following this the sanction list. And I guess with, when the full proposal builder separation is there, I, I feel like it, it would be addressed. Uh, so it, I guess it's just a matter of time in, in some degree. And yeah, good to see that, you know, people realize the importance of it. Yeah, I really enjoyed this um, this panel from DEF CON that we released a couple of weeks ago that Frederica uh, moderated. And there was a a pretty, I would like not heated, but uh, you know, so, someone somewhat disagreeing conversation between Shriram from Eigenlayer and and Phil Dian of of, uh, of Flashbots, and I, I really like the way that Shriram uh, framed it, which was essentially you know validators, you know, beyond the obvious like validating blocks and making sure blocks are like technically valid, they're simply they should simply you know be attesting transactions. Uh, and and um, and notarizing those transactions is basically they're just like attests of like the state of a block and like publish that block to the chain, and um, and I thought that was like an interesting way to frame the 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 topic of cre credible neutrality in the, in the context of validators, and yeah, I think like the ecosystem should, should uh, do everything it can to like you know arrive at that goal where a validator is is simply just like attesting transactions and is not doing any sort of um you know censorship or like choosing what transactions should make it in the block or not yeah i guess in the end the thing is like who chooses it then you know i guess you need someone to build a block or somehow to have this order i guess in proposal builder separation you just have this builder role and then it's kind of like outsource to them to do this, which I don't know if it changed much, just shifts the responsibility, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I might end up being more centralized too, right? Because I think uh, at least it seems like a high likelihood if you're going to have some specialized builder, which may be a pretty complex role that then you end up having, you know, two, three parties that are like making all the blocks. 
Right. Like, yeah, validators you already have quite a few in a, in a sense, right? Like companies that do it. Yeah, builder is definitely. I don't see how it how it can be. Probably it's got to be less companies. Yeah, I agree. How are you guys thinking about this at Chorus? What's your your philosophy around this? I mean, maybe Felix, you you were is that trade secrets? Uh... <laughs> yeah. yeah, we can't give away our competitive advantage here. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I think, I guess, I think also one thing that definitely happened is that it's kind of like over compliance, I would say, in, in for some yeah. of the people that they like just kind of put the censorship list in, in practice, just, even though like no one really asked them maybe. And I think that is probably too much. I think we definitely, Chorus, right, our philosophy is that we need the censorship resistance. We need a decentralized ecosystem. And I guess we would support that. But obviously, if if like there's like super clear regulatory guidance, you can't do this, then we probably wouldn't do it. But I guess, uh, or maybe at least then we would try to like engage with the regulators to the extent possible for us and convince them of the the need of this. Uh, I guess that's already what we would support now. But yeah, I do feel that some of the organizations uh, maybe over complied to this, um, and yeah, yeah, so so. I think we would avoid this. I mean, that's also my personal <laughs> view of how we internally operate. Yeah, and including, of course, the right OFAC is a U.S. thing, right? This really applies to U.S. persons so that then you have mm -hmm. like non-U.S. Um, organizations kind of complying to that is, I think. I, I, I Sorry, know. but I think the FATF uh, guidelines probably include OFAC sanctions lists and therefore anyone who wants to comply with FATF guidelines probably will. No, but OFAC. FATF is like not a regulatory thing, right? They basically... It's not, but they do have tremendous influence on the way banks and, and other institutions and anyone who interacts with financial system works. I mean, maybe sure, in the context but no, of... But OFAC is a not. US thing. It does not apply. Sure, no, no, like, it, it, it is, yeah. yeah. But I think FATF in their guidelines pro probably includes OFAC or like the OFAC sanctions list. No, no I'm not no. sure about this, but I, I mean, I, I, think I think if you're the, I mean, the, I think FATF, I mean, again, also I'm not an expert on this at all, right? So maybe I'm wrong, but I think FATF definitely has like guidance that, you know, different countries have to do some sort of money, you know, uh, you know, money laundering controls and whatnot, but then, um, but yeah, FAT, the OFAC thing is like US Treasury Department, you know, declaring some countries being like, you know, I mean, most it's around countries, right? The OFAC thing, right? It's mostly like, oh, you can't deal with Iran because the US doesn't like Iran. But for example, that doesn't apply to European companies. They can deal with Iran. I guess where it becomes tricky is, let's say, if you're a European bank, but you sort of relying on, you know, access to like or, or connections with the U.S. financial institutions, then you're like, OK, um, maybe we also have to comply with this, even though it technically doesn't apply because we're worried about like our U.S. counterparties then saying like, oh, we don't deal with you or like losing access to some kind of, you know, U.S. financial services that they need. Right. So I think in the in the traditional financial industry, I think definitely this kind of OFAC stuff ends up getting adopted by uh, non-US organizations just because they're uh, scared of like uh, having losing access to the US things. But yeah, so. You're muted, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you're right. I mean, FATF does have. Uh, I'm looking here, like countries that they monitor, and like also the EU uh, publishes a list of uh, either blacklisted or they don't call it blacklist, but they, essentially it's like blacklisted countries. Um, so, um, what? Um, yeah, with with regards to like Ethereum, and um, I think like in the continuation of our conversation here with regards to Ethereum. Um, you guys had written here uh, ZKVM and uh, Eigenlayer. Why are you uh, so excited about uh, these two things? Yeah, I guess 
uh, I think these were like, for, for my perspective, so I was on a bunch of Ethereum conferences this year too, and, and I guess I'm following it quite closely. So I feel like these are the two big innovative or like uh, interesting things that, that happened in, in the Ethereum ecosystem this year. I mean, CKEVM, I guess it's just like a very technological um, advance and quite uh, advanced in, in that space, it seems, so that, you know, you can fully um, basically write normal EVM solidity code and uh, in, in ZK. So I guess that might like change the way we see decentralized applications or how they work and how they scale and the privacy components of it. So I, I think that could be just a big game changer in that sense. And I mean, yeah, just impressive how how fast this ZK space is also moving, I, I guess, which which we we all see, saw over the last two year, three years, right? I guess it, it has been really like a Cambrian explosion of all these cryptographic advances. And, and I, I think it's like slowly moving into, yeah, practice in the crypto networks with, with actual, actual applications around it. Uh, and um, yeah, I guess that that's exciting. I mean, I'm personally not even, you know, you don't know, you don't even know what to expect, right? It's, it's, I think some of the killer apps will come from this, uh, from ZK stuff in general, right? That because there you actually can do things that you couldn't do really before in the, in the CFI or off chain world. Um, and, um, so I'm quite excited about that. I, I don't know. Yeah. What do you guys think about like zero knowledge in, in general, maybe, or I guess ZKVM specific, uh, yeah, I think it's, yeah. I mean, like, I think it's super cool. I mean, um, the, all the, re I, I think that the, I think one thing that like crypto has accelerated ZK research in a way that no other technology or industry has in the last years. And, and then there's all these really interesting and cool use cases. So like I was talking with like Penumbra a couple of weeks ago and, you know, it just like blew my mind that, you know, in the, you know, more like in the IBC ecosystem, you could use Penumbra to execute transactions in IBC, uh, you know, in, in like non ZK, uh, zones, but you're sort of executing those transactions from the literal penumbra, right? Like you are in the shadows and you're executing your transactions and like things like that, like get me super excited about crypto. Uh, yeah, where, where I have doubts is about like usability and this is always a challenge and, you know, for a lot of privacy preserving technologies and applications, it's, it's often the case that they're used by like a small niche of people who are, you know, very, very passionate about the stuff. And, um, it rarely makes its way into like, I think the mainstream, at least I don't have any good examples of that. So yeah, I hope well, that we SSL. SSL. Yeah. SSL is one example. Uh, SSL is, a, is, is one uh, good example. But like things like Signal and stuff like that. Um, but SSL was implemented as a kind of infrastructure layer, and 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 you know in in that in that sense, you know SSL was implemented to protect pro a, a payment information. You know, in the early days of the web in the '90s, like they they built HTTPS SSL to protect credit card data, and um, you know this could be where also where uh, ZK plays a huge role is like protecting people's financial information. Um, for that though, you need like a massive kind of adoption of crypto as a, as a starting point and then a, um, uh, an implementation that would allow people to remain pr private in their transactions. Well, I mean, I, I guess the ZK thing, right, has like several dimensions. I'm, per you know, there is the, the kind of scalability aspect which uh, which I guess is probably where like most of the activity is at the moment. Um, and um, I think that's seems pretty promising. I guess there seem to be like issues around now you have something that happened. Yeah, I think 
I mean, there, it, it's, there's a lot of complexity there, right? And I think a lot of open questions still are like, you know, how well is that going to work? I am personally especially excited. I think kind of Sebastian, what you brought up is the whole privacy thing, because I think this is like a huge, huge, huge issue. It's really the biggest issue I think in crypto today is like a lack of privacy. And I think it's going to, it's very scary, right? Because all of this information is here and you will be able to go back in time and it will all still be here. And now if you see like AI and all of the progress here, like I think you can kind of have to assume that like everything will be fully known about, you know, what are all your wallet addresses? What is everything that you were doing? And probably kind of soon. And that's mm. just like, hmm, you know, really not great, right? Because I think that's, I mean, from a private security perspective, right? Like makes it vulnerable to being like robbed and attacked. From a perspective of the government cracking down on stuff, it makes it, you know, if, if you know, I don't know, there's some DAO and you can just figure out who are all the token holders and like pretty easy to shut down the DAO. And and I'm definitely worried that the pro, I mean, from a tax perspective. It, yeah, taxes. Uh, no, to, for sure. I mean, I, I, I still think this is going to be the, the, the main way that governments are going to like crack down on crypto. I think it's going to be through taxation, you know, that they're basically going to be like, you've been saying this for years. Yeah. Right. yeah. I think it's going to, yeah. I, I feel like pretty confident on that. Um, Cause it's just going to be so easy, you know, like you're going to have all of the data uh, given the tax rules and given how crypto works, it's basically inevitable that almost everyone didn't pay the taxes correctly. And then you can go after them and you don't even have to invent any new rules, regulations. You can find them. You can make make their lives a pain. Um, and I am worried that the progress uh, when it comes to privacy tech in crypto is very slow. It's not great. Uh, like we are nowhere near having yeah. kind of privacy preserving crypto. I think that's like... How far is that away? Five years, more, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's far away, right? Like scalability, we're kind of solving, right? But privacy, not at all. Uh, yeah. And I think that is, that is a big concern. Yeah, I mean, there is like the linear growth of these of these you know, technologies and like people building use cases and like people trying to adopt them and stuff. But then they're like, you know, you're mentioning SSL. Uh, up until like the early 2010s, I think it was like 2011 or 2012, uh, or maybe even earlier. Um, most websites didn't use SSL. You used SSL when you interacted with your bank to do to, when you went to the payment portal. But when you were just like logging in or whatever, you weren't using SSL. And then Google decided that it was a good idea for everyone to start using SSL. And since Chrome was one of the major browsers and most used browsers on the internet, um, they uh, they they basically like force everyone to start using SSL because if you didn't use SSL one, your website would be um, not ranked so well in SEO. And then the other reason was that you would get like this big kind of like red warning, this website is not secure, et cetera. And so like that forced the whole industry to move to SSL. And it would be great if we had like some sort of forcing event in crypto where like some, uh, you know, application that was used by like, you know, lots and lots of people, um, would sort of impose uh, privacy on 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 users, but like we're not at a scale yet where like enough people are using crypto, and also crypto is super fragmented. Where you know there's like tons of wallets, nothing is um, you know very few standards across different ecosystems. I mean, like you have standards in Ethereum, you don't have the same standards in Cosmos or in Solana or anything else, and it's hard. Like I was I, I was talking to Dogemos about this yesterday, and it's like the, the fragmentation at the at the wallet layer. And also at the infrastructure that makes it very difficult to create like industry-wide standards. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the issue is like, you, I mean, someone creates an application that's like private. I don't know, let's say someone creates a private DEX. It's like, okay, that's nice. But now if all of my addresses are like de-anonymized and I'm like moving something in there and then like taking something out, like, 
how much does it really help, right? Like not that much. Uh, maybe it helps with some things, but maybe it helps with like, I don't know, funds are more comfortable to trade because you, you maybe you can't like link some trades. So maybe there are like some things like that, right? But I think the, you know, like the fundamental privacy, super hard, right? I mean, I guess private transact, like this sort of private payments, like Zcash, Monero have it. Uh, you know, that, that yeah. I guess seems like, um, you know, achievable and maybe the technology is kind of there for that, but then smart contract interactions and like DeFi and like cross chain. And I um, mean, so hard or NFT stuff. How are you going to do private NFT stuff? Uh, secret network. They're already doing it. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, CVN network was just like uh, kind of fell apart. No, uh, it's just like a SGX. I mean, they. I, I guess okay. I don't know exactly, but I guess some of the history was. I think all of the now, history. All of the history. Oh, really? I mean, I, oh. I'm. I, I also have not. So I have not super closely read about this. So yeah, I may be wrong. But what I did kind of read was basically. There's some like there was some SGX vulnerability that basically allows anyone to go back through like all of the history of the of the secret blockchain and like de anonymize like you everything. could like decrypt yeah sure yeah I, I think something like this I'm not sure if if that's still possible or definitely I think there is like a new architecture where I, I guess they mitigated it and from now going forward it would not be like that but yeah it's obviously would well, be a big event. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, for now, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I guess that's also the issue with this technology, right? It will not be in production for long before you, yeah, you need to have like a certain time it's running to understand if it's really like non-exploitable or like, I guess the kind of Lindy effect. So I do agree that everything would be like five plus years out. I think though, right, if you can have private computation or like on the smart, then then it doesn't really matter. Then you can do private NFTs, then you can do whatever, right? It doesn't really limit you if you can do it like generalized. And I guess that's what Z ZK, EVM, and, and these kind of things are trying to do. Um, right. Here is a making use of the StreamYard features here, Seb. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm on this website. It's like sjx.fail and, uh, you know, one of the like the top thing is secret network and then i guess yeah. like some dvd technology that got that got pwned but yeah uh this is this just came out like a couple of days ago okay well my uh my my meta rats nfts are, are now doxed <laughs> <laughs> exactly i guess probably it won't be that, won't be that womp womp um <laughs> yeah well, um how about yeah how about the cosmos ecosystem uh Let's, uh, yeah, maybe some of the interesting things here, I think, you know, obviously, well, I mean, there, I think like there's been some progress, but it's also been, I feel, I feel like it's, it's, it's been a little sluggish, um, you know, the, the whole like Adam 2.0 thing over the last couple of, well, I guess like two months, uh, has been a little bit draining. I feel like on the, on the community and, um, I'm not really sure like where things go from here. Um, it's it's unclear to me now. Like I, f I feel like th there's a there's a lot of questions around what is the future of the hub. Like more so than um, than like when we were having these debates. And um, yeah, like I guess interchain security is going to get implemented fairly soon. But as for all of the other you know features that. Um, that were included in this in this white paper you know the mev stuff the uh the the allocator all these other things i feel like we're uh, a long time away from from seeing these things being implemented or like at least some progress being made on this front um what, what are your thoughts on where where the cosmos hub is heading i mean not not that this is like the entire cosmos ecosystem but how, how did yeah. you come out of that whole debate 
Yeah, I mean, I guess, first of all, yeah, I mean, Cosmos, I feel like Cosmos ecosystem is doing super well, right? Like lots of new chains and like lots of activity. The interest from VCs has increased a lot this year. So there was like funding, I think it's up, like, I don't know how much, but like by a huge amount. Uh, so I, I think Cosmos ecosystem, you know, it looks super bullish. Now, when it comes to the Cosmos hub, um, I mean... On some level, this there was always this this question, right? For for a long time, there's been this question of like, what's the Cosmo top for? I mean, there was this kind of idea back in the white paper of this IBC routing hub, but people didn't really seem to like believe in that so much, and uh, that hasn't happened. And it, I guess it doesn't. You know, IBC at this point is much more like point-to-point -point connections, which of course has like uh, big advantages too. And so I think it's unlikely that this whole routing hub thing comes. And of course that has kind of been, I think, abandoned more or less. Uh, and then, yeah, but then it was like, okay, what's the hub for? Indigenous security, right, is, is obviously coming or it seems to be coming, right? Uh, progressing well and stuff. And there's like demand. So I think this is pretty good, right? Like that's something that I think was way less certain before. And now seems like, you know, very likely, including like a whole bunch of like solid things that want to deploy on it. So I think from that point of view, like the hub looks like uh, better than a year ago, right? Now there is of course a question of like how much value does interchange security bring? And, you know, does it kind of justify like the market cap of Adams? Because I think to some extent, Adam has been treated as this, uh, you know, you buy Adams and you have some kind of, you know, exposure to the Cosmos ecosystem, even though that's not, not really true. Uh, or maybe it's true to some extent, but, you know, it doesn't like someone builds a chain on Cosmos and it succeeds doesn't necessarily mean it any any value accrues to atoms i think the whole atom 2.0 thing yeah i'm not sure exactly how things are gonna progress further um yeah i mean i, I feel like the discussion was very vibrant and vigorous and very engaged and i think that was good you know i did have a lot of reservations around I think the way the proposal was done, which I guess was shared by others, so it kind of got rejected. In the end, it was very close. Um, I, yeah, and I, I do feel like coming back with more, uh, you know, more actually concrete, limited, clear proposals, uh, you know, is the right way. Uh, and it, yeah, I, I guess. So let's see, let's see. But I, I would say overall, I feel the Cosmos Hub has progressed in the last year, although maybe not as much and as fast as one would have hoped. Yeah, F Felix? Yeah, I, yeah, I would agree to all this. I think the, it's also kind of what's, it's not too surprising, right? Because it's such a decentralized system and they're so hard to convince everyone of, of something. And um, I mean, a lot of the things in the past, even before all this, have struggled to to gain the right like traction that, that other ecosystems or other like centralized, more centralized layer ones or ecosystems have less problems with because there is, I guess, just one um united like company organization that kind of pushes forward with with a certain direction so yeah i i think in this case i do agree that yeah interchain security seems to at least have that traction i think the, the issue then is right interchain security can be implemented by every cosmos zone and um a lot of the zones also or chains plan to kind of offer security to some some other chains, like I think Evmos, for example, or, or I actually probably almost everyone, Osmosis, uh, wanting to also interchange secure chains. So I do kind of believe that there will also be this, this mesh security system in, in the long run that like, you know, 
chains provide security to each other, uh, uh, both being a provider and a kind of um, consumer. So in that sense, I guess it again questions a little bit what that means for the Cosmos Hub, if, if that's the um, future. Um, but yeah, overall, I think the ecosystem is developing very fast. A lot of people entering the Cosmos ecosystem, like almost everyone we speak to, um, or like, yeah, I guess we, we're also pretty heavy in the, in the Cosmos ecosystem, but still, you know, you see a lot of teams coming in that, that weren't really native or new to crypto from other uh, Web2 or TradFi, and, and they, they start building in Cosmos. So I think that's extremely bullish. And we, we've really seen a lot of new teams like that emerge. And um, yeah, uh, super excited for that. Um, I guess, you know, um, yeah, I don't know what, what your guys' thoughts are on on that tr traction that the Cosmos yeah. has. And I think also that application-specific, I guess, story overall seems to like be adopted even by other ecosystems like Ethereum with the L2 stuff. So I do think Cosmos uh, is on the right path and furs is the law yeah. in that sense. I think the I think um, I, I echo your sentiment about the, uh, you know, like just tons of people coming into the ecosystem. What I think is really exciting about that is that we have all these people who are coming into the ecosystem that, you know, weren't weren't in Cosmos before. Like they, these are like new people. They just like found about found out about it on their own, and now they're using the technology and they're using it to build things um, that they think are interesting or valuable. And uh, it's bringing all this these new ideas and this kind of like diversity of like, people and backgrounds to the space uh, that you know makes for like really good innovation and like. Um, uh, like like good, like lots of great ideas coming into the space just generally, um, and uh, yeah, like the app the app chain thesis seems to be also picking up in other spaces as well. I wonder, like I, m the thing that I'm struggling to to like wrap my head around right now is how the app chain thesis and the modular thesis um, sort of come, come together. You know, uh, do they start overlapping at some point? Do app chains you know, merge or s slowly become, you know, uh, more modular either through shared security uh, by outsourcing uh, maybe like parts of the settlement uh, or data availability to other, to, to other kind of infrastructure layers. And uh, I, yeah, I think like this whole space is super interesting to me. And I find that like any innovation and like any kind of new design patterns happening in this space is, uh, you know, it's great because like we get to see, we get to figure out which which is the best way to build the stuff such that it scales and uh, it could be usable and like it, you know, uh, remains secure and maybe also by scaling it and by modularizing it at some point, we can start putting in more like ZK and privacy layers that, um, that spread out across the whole ecosystem. Yeah, I mean, I I totally think right that that this experimentation is yeah what makes Cosmos so strong, right? And then you can have like one chain do like a th certain thing a little different way, and if it works out, right, others will adopt it. So I guess this emergent properties um, uh, is a very strong starting point. And yeah, then let's see when Celestia comes along and all these these things how how that will change the space I, I am definitely excited for that i think also you know like from some of the new teams like say and there's there's also like talks of layer two on cosmos you know so basically that kind of uh, this this structure uh also being adopted in in cosmos uh and maybe other vms so that that seems super interesting yeah brian uh i know you want to talk about urbit <laughs> uh, yeah, we can talk a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's definitely some, one of the things I've been most excited about this year. And uh, yeah, I mean, we've done some podcasts about it too. And Nino you know, was at the conference in Miami in uh, September, I think, which was pretty great. And, you know, it, the, you know there's, I mean, it's like an old project, right? That's been kind of developing for a long time, but I think has evolved into more of like a vibrant ecosystem with 
other companies. And I think there is, uh, you know, the crypto synergies are also becoming, coming more up. Um, you know, some examples of that include, you know, Ukbar, where, you know, they're building basically a ZK roll-up blockchain on Urbit. Uh, it's kind of like an Ethereum roll-up, but like on Urbit and using like, you know, smart contracts are written in the kind of Urbit language. So it's pretty powerful, right? Because you could write like your application uh, in this along with your smart contracts. And of course, the way Urbit applications work is that they're running on people's servers, right? So you, and th that becomes, I think, quite relevant when you, tied in with some of the things we talked about before around, you know, trying to crack down on front ends and regulating DeFi. And um, there was, I think just, I don't know, two weeks ago or a few weeks ago, I saw someone show like a demo of, you know, them having the Uniswap front end running on Urbit, right? Because, uh, you know, that's pretty powerful, right? Because you could just take the front end, deploy it on Urbit, and then, people can sort of run their own front ends and interface with that. And then you don't really have that ability to regulate front ends anymore. So I do think that it's, uh, it's a more resilient way of, um, of addressing some of these issues around, uh, you know, also privacy, right? Like you, you can have a lot more privacy this way too. And uh, you can have more control. You could, it can be more censorship resistant. So I do expect that we, you know, we're going to see a lot more of that. Now, Urbit is still kind of early as an ecosystem. So it's probably another year or more until that kind of stuff really starts working. Um, but, you know, I think it's, it's uh, you know, it's coming and, um, and I think it will end, it could end up becoming like you know very powerful where right? it becomes kind of this like operating system layer uh, for crypto. There's also one thing actually. There's a very in a way one of the best arguments I think for Urban in crypto is ironically this you know big criticism of crypto where um, you know the, the Signal founder Moxie Marlin Spike wrote this article. Um, let me just look for it briefly. So it was it was a few months ago and it was very widely shared. Uh, my first impressions of Web3. We can put the link in the show notes. Um, but it's basically he, you know, he was like, okay, this crypto thing is nice. Uh, well, he's like, well, they talk about all this decentralization and, and maybe there is that kind of decentralization like, you know, on the blockchain level but then when people actually interface with the stuff right it's you using some rpc node that like you kind of trust or at the very least they're like tracking all your data and you don't have any privacy and he's like what is this bullshit and he talks a lot about like you know here people don't want to run their own servers and never will uh, and so he's basically says like, Hey, crypto without people running their own servers, like doesn't make sense because you're still trusting others. And, uh, and of course that's exactly what Arabid is addressing, right. To make it really easy for people to run their own server. Um, and yeah. And so I think it's, I think it will, yeah, I think it's going to be, become very important and uh, you know, a tremendous area of like innovation and growth and, and a sort of merging of, I think, Urban and crypto that's gonna happen in the next you know, year, two years, three years. Hmm. Not, not, not to like dive deep into, make, make this an Urban dive deep, deep dive, but can you, uh, can you run like an Urban server on your phone or something like that? Or is it, is it something that's possible to do on, uh, on this sort of device or does it have to be like an always on kind of thing or that, you know, where you're either running it on a computer in your house or like on a Raspberry Pi or on a server or at a VM. Well, somewhere. yeah, well, it doesn't, it, it has to be on when you use it, right. Or when you rely on it. 
So yeah. you, you could have it run on your computer. I mean, you can do that, right? And then you could just, uh, I mean, it's definitely, it definitely works in terms of, you know, the amount of resources it needs totally, totally suitable to run on, on someone's computer. Uh, maybe you could run it on a phone. Uh, I don't think that is possible today, but maybe you could. The issue with that, though, is if you think of if you think of um, it like if you're using like a SaaS product, right? You're using some application, and then it inter it interfaces with like a server, right? Then and maybe the application's on your phone or on your computer or somewhere else. Then you need that server to be running, uh, and you know that server is maybe on AWS and. It's by some company, so like you can rely on that, that works. So when you're in an urban world, uh, let's say now you have a smart contract app, it, and you want it to use on your, co in, on your phone, and then other times you're using on your computer and stuff, you, you will want to speak, like you basically want to make API calls to your server. Uh, and if the server, like, let's say if you have it on your computer and then your computer's not running and now you have an urban app on your phone, uh, you, you can't use the app anymore because it can't talk to the server, right? Because the computer's not running, right? So mm -hmm. I think, uh, so I think it's going to depend on like, what are you using it for? I think if you're like, let's say you're using it for like, I'm just, I'm, doing crypto transactions with Orbit, right? And I have it on my home computer and I'm just booting it up when I'm doing crypto transactions and otherwise, like, I think that should actually work fine. Uh, but if you use it, if you want to use it as a more, I mean, the ambition of Orbit is much larger, right? To do a lot more things. Then I think you do need to have the always on thing. Uh, could you just have the state be synced? Like, it, it, couldn't you say, like, have the state like the encrypted state just synced to say like an iCloud and then your phone just is always kind of syncing in the same way that you use like a Google Drive sync or something like that? You mean you're syncing your Orbit server to the iCloud and then you're syncing the phone from there? Yeah, I, I don't know. Like, I don't know what like, what well, a, I mean, I suppose there's data in there and there must be like some package that you can just kind of sync. Well, but if, if you are syncing your... Like if you have your your Orbit node on your phone and then you're syncing it to the cloud uh, and then you're like syncing, like you communicate with that from your phone, then why not just run it in the cloud, right? Like what's the point of your... Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I think there's like two, I think there's like basically two paths, right? One is that you you having, you're hosting it with a third party in the cloud uh, or you're hosting it with a third party who guarantees reliability and stuff. So we have been actually working on that at course one, right? To like build this stuff. And I think okay. the other wow. option is that you're going to have like a, a device, like a hardware device that's like on, you know, and there's also a company working on this. There's one called Native Planet. It looks really cool. Uh, but, uh, you know, we basically have something you can just plug in at home and then there's your Orbit thing and, you, you know, you'll be able to connect with it and it can always be on. Uh, or there could be a more limited use case, right? If you say like, oh, I'm going to use it for crypto and, you know, I just use it when I use it and then it runs on my computer and otherwise it's off. And, and I think that actually makes a lot of sense also because maybe you want, would want to segregate it, right? Maybe you'd have like one Orbit where like, you're doing your communication stuff. Maybe you have another one where it's like crypto transactions and that you run on your own computer at home and it just runs sometimes. So maybe something like that could make sense. Overall though, it's it's easier to run. Like if you if you would say, just compare like a Urbit node or ship or whatever it's called with, with, a, with a, a Ethereum validator or something, you think um, yeah, it I think be it's much easier to run it? Run. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. Right. And even if you go down, right, you don't you really do have this on immediate like that no. financial penalty or anything. No, there's no financial penalty of going down at all. Yeah, right. you can. So uh, yeah. also, you don't have to sit if you boot up again. There's nothing to sync, right? There's no like yeah state. Yeah, state to right. sync. Yeah. Oh, wait, but um, oh, I had another question. Do you have upgrades or something for the Urbit software on this? 
Yeah, but they're all automated. Like you don't have to do anything. Okay. But and then who huh. decides what's the upgrade or how does this? Well, I think it depends on the kind of upgrade, right? Uh, but uh, I think the apps can upgrade themselves, right? Or um, y if you have a more like, if it's like a I don't know whole network level, yeah, upgrade. And I think that you know there's kind of like a governance body that will have to, would have to vote on, uh, you know, if there's like some very low level upgrade um but that those are say, i mean the whole design of it is that this is like it, those would be extremely rare events or like you get to the point where it, like that never happens um i think that's gonna be my christmas uh vacation uh project i'm gonna install an urbit server on my i've got a little server here in the house so I'll try to set that cool, up cool that sounds great <laughs> um is there anything else we uh we want to we want to talk about here. I think we covered most of it, yeah. I mean, there was Solana. Is there any? And uh, maybe, yeah, maybe yeah, just Solana uh, your came, thoughts on what's short. what's going on with Solana and what is the yeah. future of this ecosystem given the pain they're suffering. Yeah, I think it's like a big trial by fire, right, of the whole community and um the resilience of the ecosystem. I do think there's a lot of like developers on there, right? There's dApps, there is teams that are doing interesting work and, and I do think will come out stronger from from it. Um, you know, funnily enough, right? There was the Breakpoint Conference, the second one this year, just before the whole FTX collapse. And um, I felt, you know, there's stuff going on. There are even like one of the first ecosystems, or I think actually maybe the, the first outside of Ethereum that is working on client diversity in a serious way, right? With Jump building this Fire Dancer client that will essentially also improve the performance of Solana even more and, and kind of finally uh, even like create a spec for what Solana is. <laughs> and I guess also improve the <laughs> actual Solana yeah. labs client itself so i think that that's a very mature sign of maturity and um yeah so overall i think quite exciting here to stay and um, keep building keep building i think that's uh i think that's probably a good note to end on and and, and certainly um i guess the the sentiment that a lot of people who are building um have right now you know beyond the fud and everything you know, i think the overwhelming narrative that that i see on like crypto twitter and you know people who are coming on the podcast and everything is like just got to keep building and i mean like we've been through this before already and uh we built and like we built a bunch of stuff during those during those those bear markets and out of all of that work and and innovation and uh came you know new applications and so yeah i think just keep on biddling <laughs> yeah absolutely i think uh nothing really has changed right like it's just, uh, <laughs> i mean a lot has changed and nothing has changed right i feel like when it comes to like yeah the why and where is it all going and stuff. It's, it's, I think it's the same and it's, it's just a long journey, right? Like, I mean, we, we are still, I mean, we talked about the privacy thing, right? I'm like, okay. And I think everyone was always aligned that, okay, privacy is essential. There needs to be privacy or pretty much everyone. But then we're also like, oh, it's like five years off, 10 years off, right? So I think for crypto to really like realize its potential, you know, it's another, you know, it's 10, 20, 30, 40 years ahead still, right? Like it's a long, long time. And, but it's still so exciting, so much happening and so cool to work on it. Yeah. I mean, I think like we're still super early and I keep telling this to people, you know, like uh, look look at 15 years ago where the web was. And like in like 15 years ago, we didn't have, you know, secure websites. We were still using Flash to do video. Uh, you know, there was like no unified experience between browsers and certainly not between mobile and desktop. 
um, yeah, like, I mean, it, it, it was like a mess. I mean, I was building on the web 15 years ago and like, it was really hard. And uh, there were all these problems that um, we didn't know how to solve. And we solved them in the last 15 years. And, it, you know, we, we think that like, we've always had, you know, flashy mobile phones. Like we forget that 15 years ago, like building on the web was a shit show and it didn't scale very well. And um, and then, like, yeah, massive investments in infrastructure and tooling and, and standards allowed us to get to where we are now. And we're still at only 60% of the population using the web of the world's population, you know? So, yeah, it's a long game. Um, yeah, guys, uh, this has been great. And um, I wish you both uh, happy year and holidays. And also to all our listeners, uh, thanks for tuning in and thanks for being here for with us for yet another year and uh we'll do this again next year yeah thanks so much looking forward to episode 500 yeah it's coming soon <laughs> all right yeah Bye -bye. cool thanks so much everyone and enjoy your holidays <laughs>